All right, welcome to uh, Furthering Christendom. Uh, I'm Tyler McNabb. Uh, Mike unfortunately can't be here today, but uh, we do have a great guest here, a good line, Joshua Ferris, Dr. Joshua Ferris. How are you doing? I'm great. How do you like my, my halo in the back? Yeah, it's makes you look extra holy, you know. Yes. I, have, have you been uh, uh, becoming a saint since I last seen you? I've been working on it, yeah. Well, I first became an Anglican, so that helps. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm working on it. I'm in my parish library right now. So it, it's, um, you can see the, the holiness in the background. I see, I see. Very good. Um, so you're, you're in Texas uh, once again, which means you are able to access Whataburger, which is so much better than In-N-Out. Uh, at least you have more access now than you did um, uh, so many months ago. Is, is that right? That's, that's right. Uh, so I'm in Alpine, Texas right now, and Alpine is, is sort of a cowboy country, you might say. Um, uh, but uh, it's 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 deep west country, so um, deep west Texas, um, and uh, it's out in well, we actually have mountains out here, which is unusual for Texas. So we, um, it's uh, the, there there is Whataburger, and since I've been here, I have had Whataburger a few times, and despite what uh, some will say, like a palmonada. Um, Whataburger is excellent. Whataburger is wonderful. And, and in principle, I'm, I'm committed to Whataburger, well, because, well, Texas is just better than California, and that's where in and out comes from, and California is just a b bunch of liberals. So there we are. I love you, Paul, but... Yeah, and, it, and, and I mean, the fancy ketchup, I mean, can, can any ketchup compare to the greatness that is fancy ketchup? No. And then the spicy fancy ketchup. I mean, exactly. And the spicy fries. ketchup. Just, Where do you like, get spicy ketchup? No, no, no contest. That's right. Where do you get spicy ketchup? That, that, that is Texas. Yeah, that's, that's Texas. That's Texas for you. Spicy ketchup. That's, that's yeah. right. That's right. Paul, Paul has some confusion sometimes. So, He's confused. Speaking of confusing views, speaking mm -hmm. of confusing views, uh, there is Christian physicalism right? Mm -hmm. As yes. some might call it. What's, what's it mean to be a Christian physicalist? Who are some kind of proponents of this view? And uh, give me sort of a, an argument that might motivate someone to accept this, this view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Christian materialism. So when we talk about materialism, we're talking about the, the, the if we just step back for a moment, we're talking about the view that, uh, well, all things are um, material all the way down, uh, that everything that exists, all the things that we can count numerically, things or substances, substances or property bearers, all those things are material in nature. They are, so substances themselves are material in nature. There is no uh, immaterial thing like a mind or a soul that can be detached or that is, um, that is uh, conceptually or modally distinct from uh, the material aggregate or material substance or body itself. And Christian, there, there has been a growing number of Christians or theologians, if we're thinking about materialism in a, in specifically in a theological context, there's been a growing number who have uh, supported or affirmed materialism in the broader theological and uh, more specifically Christian world. And uh, so, uh, which sounds uh, on the surface, at least, um, I don't know, 20 years ago, I mean, uh, it, it sounds a little odd to be, to couple those terms together, because historically, uh, well, most of the Christian church, most of the church Catholic has been, um, has affirmed something that transcends the material, uh, something that is substantial, that is non-material, or at least some um, immaterial ingredient that is not explicable or reducible to um, the material itself. And that's just been par for the course throughout most of, um, well, theistic history, but uh, especially Christian history. Um, uh, so it is, it is a little odd. And if you're committed to the tradition, you're, you're committed to this, this sort of view, 
then uh, it is sort of a little odd to put these things together. But nonetheless, there are a growing number of Christian philosophers who are affirming uh, some sort of uh, doctrine of materialism of the world, and particularly when it comes to human beings. And I think uh, one of the reasons, uh, if we're uh, looking at uh, sort of theological arguments, one of the theological arguments that has been advanced by Christian materialists or physicalists is uh, the argument from the doctrine of resurrection. So um, many will uh, say, uh, well, let me step back and put forward some of the popular Christian materialists right now who are defending the position. So Kevin Corcoran's a big one uh, who has defended the position and he wrote a book for Baker in 2006 and uh, it was entitled, um, well, I'm, I'm blanking on the name right now, Rethinking Human Nature, I think that's it. Um, that's the title, subtitle had something to do with uh, a defensive material, Christian materialism or something. Um, uh, a little short book, but in, in his book, um, he, he advances a common argument that is reflected amongst other Christian physicalists like uh, Joel Green, who's a New Testament scholar, and uh, um, also, um, uh, uh, well, uh, Nancy, Nancy Murphy, who's another scholar who's uh, done a lot of work to advance Christian materialism and to criticize alternative uh, ontologies, in, including the sort of the broader traditional view, if there is a traditional view um, or set of traditional views. And then uh, there are others like, um, uh, there are certainly other physicalists, uh, uh, philo philosophical physicalists that are out there who are also Christian developing arguments uh, for physicalism like well, like, uh, for example, Eric Yang is one up and comer um, who's well recognized now, and um, as well as um, Trenton Merricks and Peter Van and Wagen. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's, there's a few others who are defending it. But there's a common theological argument that Kevin Corcoran raises in his book, A Rethinking Human Nature, where he argues that if we look at the biblical text and the way that the scriptures develop, um, uh, or unfold this uh, understanding of human nature, we have to look at how the biblical text develops uh, eschatology. And uh, so uh, for Kevin Corcoran and many others, they see the sort of impulse in scripture as, as being um, directed toward the physical resurrection, the, the, the bodily resurrection. And, um, and uh, as a result, um, they see that as the, the sort of the, 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 the culmination of God's redemptive plan for human beings. And um, they reject what has traditionally been called the disembodied state or the intermediate state of existence between bodily death on this earth and then bodily resurrection later on. So they reject that intermediate state and they see, according to them, in the scriptures, there is no place for that. There's only the place eschatologically for the bodily resurrection, the physical resurrection of the body. And so as a result of that, they see no reason to affirm anything beyond um, the, the bodily nature of human beings or the material nature of human beings because they associate it with the material nature. And so they see the impetus or the, the um, real push in scripture as it unfolds uh, an understanding of human nature to just be a, a, a material nature. Humans just are material in nature or bodily in nature, which they take to be synonymous with the material. So uh, there's a lot riding on how they're reading the text and how they see the text of scripture developing and how they're thinking about uh, uh, the um, human eschatology and what is the final state in human eschatology, which they take to be just the physical resurrection of the body. And with, uh, with that, there just is no need for anything else. So that's the big, I think, theological argument that Christian physicalists have uh, advanced and developed. And um, if you deny the disembodied state, they, they just, for, furthermore, they see no reason to affirm anything beyond uh, a, a materialist view of human nature. So, so real quick, before I ask you about objections to this particular view, um, what what do you what do they make of passages like um, uh, it's better to be away from the body and to be present with the Lord or passages where it's um, 
better to fear the one who can kill the body and and the soul, you know, these sorts of passages. How do they make sense of these passages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Joel Green, so in, Joel Green in several essays and in, including his book, um, Body uh, and Life, Body and Human Life, um, his Baker book in 2008, he advances this argument that the translation of various words in the Old and New Testament for soul that is so common to older translations of the Bible are just inaccurate translations and that there is no need to translate those words as, as soul. And so this is, he would say, this is a sort of a leftover of some philosophical baggage that has informed those translators when they translate those words. So there's no need to translate those as soul. Um, in many cases, for example, um, for example, um, historically there was there was a common um, tendency to translate nephesh as soul in the Old Testament, the, the word nephesh, and he would say, well, that's just unnecessary, and actually it's even misleading um, because it goes against the grain of the whole Old Testament text, which teaches that human beings are holistic in nature, which he takes to mean uh, materialistic in nature, just embodied, holistically embodied. And so nephesh, he would say, should be translated maybe as life or a particular kind of life, like human life. Um, but it, there's no reason to translate it as soul, as so many old bad translations have done, like the King James Version, which I love the King James Version. But anyway, um, that's another story. But he, he says those translations are just bad. They're just bad translations. Okay, so uh, how, how would someone who wants to affirm kind of the more traditional view of the human person according to the Christian tradition, how would they respond? You know, maybe if you can give me a good biblical or theological argument against this view, and then also give me maybe a good purely philosophical argument against this view. Yeah, so, yeah, good. So I think the the most important theological argument against Christian physicalism is the argument from the intermediate state. Um, there's this traditional teaching that there is an intermediate state that um, after physical death in this life, uh, there will be this interim state, this period of existing or persisting as, as the self-same being or even person arguably that has experiences, conscious experiences, and even, even traditionally many like Thomas Aquinas would say that they even have a beatific vision experience, a vision of God as the final state of humanity that um, culminates in the physical resurrection. But nonetheless, prior to the physical resurrection, they experience things and they have conscious experiences and they have experiences of God himself and his nature. And so- um, which, that, which by the way, if someone needs to do like a panel discussion on, uh, like contemporary work in the beatific vision, throwing that out, I think that might be a good idea. Yeah, funny thing you mentioned that. Yeah, that is coming up very soon, isn't it? Um, I, I think this guy Tyler wrote some paper on um, on um, uh, uh, the reliability of our cognitive faculties and how that how that provides a framework for beatific vision, right? Yeah, so something like that. Proper function and uh, and the beatific vision. Yeah, should should uh, should be should be interesting. Letting an epistemologist do theology to some degree. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Planig has done some theological work, obviously, and has warranted Christian belief, right? One of the one of the most important theological works in the last sixty years, right? Um, uh, the most important. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we are. So um, there we are. Yeah. So if you take it that there is this sort of intermediate state, and if you take it that it's a uh, purely disembodied state, um, which seems to be fairly common in the tradition, there certainly is an intermediate state between uh, physical death and physical resurrection with a, the, the state of existence and experience is just different, uh, then, um, then it, it seems to require something other than a material body because it's that 
it's precisely that material body that dies um, at physical death. It's, we can actually go and look at it. Empirically, we have evidence for it. We can look at the grave and see that the person died. And we, commonsensically, we, we arrive at the uh, conclusion that that person or that person's body at least has died. And um, whatever you make of the person, the person just is doing something else or the person has ceased to exist. And on um, materialism, it seems that quite clearly that if the body ceases to be a human body and the person is either identical to or um, dependent upon that body, necessarily dependent upon that body for persistence, then it would seem that that, that person no longer exists. There's nothing there to persist in the intermediate state. There's nothing left. So how do you make sense of that? Well, you don't as a materialist, unless, um, unless you wanna follow Peter Van and Wagen in his famous paper in the seventies, where he says, um, well, God just kind of snatches out the body and puts a replica there so that what you're experiencing right in front of you is, is what appears to be uh, uh, the, per the person's body that died, but it's really just a duplicate. It's a replicate of, of, the, of the previous body that existed. And the previous body that existed just continues to exist or something like that. So that's one of the proposals that materialists have made, but that has serious problems. And nobody actually, I don't think anybody actually believes that. I don't think Peter Van and Wagen believes that. He was just trying to tell a just so story to salvage Christian materialists who uh, believe in uh, an intermediate state. Yeah, so if, if you are a traditional Christian, then likely you affirm the beatific state, right? There's some sort of beatific vision that you have whenever you die. Um, and materialism really can't make sense of this because you're in the ground and that's all you are. <laughs> and uh, so unless you want to go through some sort of like really kind of ad hoc move, you know, implausible move, uh, like you mentioned there with Ben in wagons, um, body snatchers uh, case, then uh, yeah, it's, it seems like you're, you're gonna, you're gonna have a problem. And so, uh, no, I think that's, that's really helpful, uh, especially for those who are traditional Christians and are, who are really committed to the beatific vision, uh, then it, it doesn't really seem to make sense. What about like a philosophical argument? What would be uh, your favored philosophical argument to respond to a physicalist view of the human person? Yeah. Um, so I guess my favorite argument would be maybe the Planiga's myriological argument from replacement, um, which I think is a good place to start in thinking about human nature, uh, thinking about what it is that persons are. Um, and the material, uh, the myriological argument from replacement argues something like this there. Um, if we, um, so it's rooted in a kind of a conceivability logic that uh, conceivability gives us some access to the reality or the actual state of affairs in, in, in the world and how it's structured. And so he, um, inconceivability gives us some um, uh, uh, way to think about possibilities in the world. And so if we think about the possibilities of the body, um, we begin in our own sort of common sense sort of uh, understanding or framework we think about the various parts of our bodies, well, the various parts of our bodies can be sort of lopped off or cut off and we can continue existing without them. We can continue, you and I can continue persisting without the, the various parts of our body. So we could conceivably work through the various parts of our body and um, you know, we could lop off our hands, we could lop up our arms and we could just go through that whole process. And uh, the intuition seems to be quite clearly that the modal, uh, properties of the body are distinct from the modal properties of the person. There is no garden variety physical object that you could point to and say, that thing is me, I am that. Um, and in fact, there seems to be positive, um, uh, positive reasons for thinking that 
the modal properties of my body just or any physical thing just are different from the modal properties of me and who I am. They, um, so if I have these modal properties that seem to exist quite apart from the physical parts that uh, I inhabit or live through or interact with or experience life through uh, in an embodied way, um, then, um, and I could lose those parts and still be me, then it seems like there's some other um, thing that's making sense of the modal possibilities or the modal properties that I have that is not the same as my body. Such that um, Talifer kind of takes this argument in a different direction and he says, well, um, even at, at death, my body becomes in some ways, um, well, it, it, well, it becomes a corpse. Uh, and, and it, as a result of being a corpse, it seems to have different modal properties than I do. Whatever happens to me, there seem to be some modal properties that are distinct about the body that becomes a corpse. But um, so uh, Planiga develops this sort of myriological argument from replacement, and he sort of asks various hypothetical scenarios like, well, what if we speeded, uh, sped up the process? And he says, well, that doesn't really affect our intuitions. Our intuitions are still the same, that there is no material object or part that we could point to and say, that's me. I could lose that part and I would still be me. So, so then of course he raises the question which this presses us into a kind of modal argument for personal persistence beyond the grave or personal persistence beyond the, um, the, uh, the physical body or physical aggregate that we once occupied. And so, um, there's a kind of modal argument that, that extends from this that says something like this. If I am the very same thing as my body, then whatever is true of me is true of my body. But my body may survive without me. It may, for example, become a corpse. And I may survive without my body. So at least there's the modal possibility. And if that modal possibility by way of conceivability uh, gives us knowledge of a, an actual state of affairs, then it seems uh, possible, or it does just seem likely, or the, it does seem the case, I should say, that we have different modal properties from our body. So I might exist in a new body or exist in a disembodied state. Therefore, I'm not the very same thing as my body. There seems to be something about me that makes me distinct from my body, and my, body's, my body just is different from me if, in fact, my body um, could exist without me in some other, um, some other way, say as a corpse. Um, but this also seems to presuppose arguably a more fundamental argument or an intuition about the nature of persons, namely that persons are simple beings. They're not complex beings like material bodies or material things. Whereas in principle, Planiga would say something like this, in principle, all physical things can be um, uh, uh, dissected or um, further analyzed in terms of their parts. Um, they're not, there is no physical thing that is indivisible in principle. Um, and at least we have no reason to think that uh, physical things are indivisible or that there are uh, uh, atoms or something or particles all the way down that are themselves indivisible in principle. Um, so, um, uh, so our bodies just seem to be different than who we are as persons. We have different modal properties. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, that's really helpful. And do you discuss this at all in your, um, recent Baker book, your anthropological anthropology? Anthropology volume. An introduction to theological anthropology. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's written as an introduction, so I don't get into. Um, I do get into some of these items. I do get into um, a sort of baseline argument for the simple view of persons that seems to be rooted in this uh, muriological argument from replacement. 
I do talk about it actually in the um, in the chapter on uh, the Constitution chapter or personal identity chapter, and um, I, I, I do discuss um, the distinctions between uh, between those um, the body as having different modal properties from the person itself have, having other properties, modal properties. Um, so yeah, I do get into those a, a bit in, in the book. Uh, what, uh, what, if you wanna kind of lay out briefly, cause we're gonna give away a copy of, of the volume. So um, yeah. if you wanna yeah. go ahead and and then tell us whatever you're now working on and uh, we'll conclude. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Good. Well, um, so uh, right now I am working on the atonement, um, developing a, a, an Anselmian satisfaction view of the atonement, um, but something that's more in line with um, theological which, anthropology. Which, What's that? Which, 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 by the way, um, uh, for one of my classes, I actually had them read your paper uh, on if the father um, hated the son. Um, you co-authored it with uh, uh, Mark Hamill, I think that's his name. That's right, Mark Hamill. Um, anyway, uh, so I, I, I had them... Yeah, I had them uh, read the, that that paper, and they all overwhelmingly really liked it and, and enjoyed it. So I just wanted to throw that out there for people who uh, uh, are are listening in and might want to look into your work regarding the atonement. Excellent. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we're finishing up a book on that, and hopefully we'll have it completed next year and submitted, and and um, that uh, should. Uh, stir up some conversation. I imagine quite a bit of conversation as we're retrieving from the tradition and uh, incorporating some of those ideas in the contemporary uh, theological discussions and philosophical discussions about the atonement that don't, don't seem to be in the discussion altogether. So we're advancing that. But um, something even closer to theological anthropology is another co-authored book that I'm working on and that is on the beatific vision and uh, redeploying the resources of a reformed doctrine of beatific vision for a contemporary audience. And so that's something that um, I'm working on certainly right now as well. Um, in addition to a collection on idealism uh, and a collection on the origin of the soul where I will develop some of these ideas that we've talked about in, in favor of or in view of a creationist doctrine of uh, the soul itself or of the person um, where the person is metaphysically simple um, and um, where the person is, has to be in order to provide some sort of explanation because of the particularity, the person has to be created by God directly and immediately. So it can't come about through an evolutionary process. So those are a few things that I'm working on right now. Good stuff. Uh, look forward to maybe having you on whenever that uh, atonement book uh, publishes and uh, we, we can talk about that and talk about uh, how penal substitution is the gospel. Uh, is, isn't that right, Josh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I hope it's not the gospel. Otherwise, uh, many of the early church fathers are, may, may be in trouble. But maybe we can we maybe they they get a pass or something because it, it wasn't as developed, yeah. And and furthermore, yeah, Aquinas would be in, in trouble case. too. But um, I know you I know you, you I'm, I'm wouldn't want that. Sure, you wouldn't want that. I'm I know not sure you, if Aquinas, you want to call you want to sure Aquinas would be in trouble. But you, you want to call Aquinas's view penal substitution. But um, yeah, I don't know about that, I don't know about that. Um, but. But in case in case the listeners uh, didn't follow, I was being sarcastic, of course, when I said that penal substitution is the gospel. I was I that, that that of course was uh, not not to be taken in truth. 
<laughs> not yes. to be taken as truth, but good. I'm glad uh, you it's been it's that. been great having you. <laughs> it's been great having you on, Josh, and uh, look forward to tomorrow catching up with you tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you tomorrow.